Good morning. It's time for Daily Chapel at the LCMS International Center in St. Louis. The text is John chapter 20, verses 19 through 31. The Reverend Dr. Mark Raby is preaching. The broadcast of chapel is underwritten by LCMS International Mission and Ministry to the Armed Forces. A reading from John chapter 20. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews. Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of anyone, they are forgiven. If you withhold forgiveness from anyone, it is withheld. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, the disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands, and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. O Lord, have mercy upon us. Thanks be to God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. It would be quite a sad lot if we stopped at the first half of John chapter 20, stopping only with the disciples there locked behind closed doors for fear of the Jews. What they know that, even as they are locked behind those doors, is that Jesus has died and he's been laid in the tomb. Yet the women reported he's risen from the dead. But such a report they dismissed as foolish talk. And at this point, Jesus is gone. The tomb is empty. They had hoped he was the one to redeem Israel. The hope they had was all Jesus. The purpose they had was all Jesus as well. And so if we only stop there, things look quite bleak. In fact, we wouldn't even be gathered here today if he hadn't been risen from the dead. The Messiah is dead in their minds, and the tomb is empty, and if the disciples survive the next few days in their minds, they're thinking, what's going to happen to me? Perhaps Simon the Zealot could go back to the politics of zealotry, scheming with others on how to get Rome out of Judea by any means possible. But if Jesus lost to the Romans, what about them? Matthew could go back to tax collecting. There's good money there, but so what? He's seen plenty of examples like the rich young ruler and Judas, men whose obsession with money led them to despair. Good money doesn't give hope and purpose. Perhaps uh, Peter, James, and John could go back to fishing. Nothing's wrong with that if you're a good fisherman. But... Uh, Indeed, that would provide a living, but it's not a life. So no matter the disciples' perceptions, their conclusions, as they're locked there in the room for fear of the Jews, that indeed all is lost and they ought to live in fear, Jesus then shows up. He appears in their midst. Behind, he comes through those locked doors and declares peace be with you. And then he proceeds to show them his hands and his side. He demonstrates that indeed he is alive. And what joy the disciples must have had in the midst of their confusion and overwhelmed, even though they've heard the report, there must have been joy that day. 
peace be with you. And thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. It's not as they believed. The resurrection and the life had risen from the dead and stood there in their midst. And therefore, there is hope. There is confidence that the grave cannot hold the Lord. Indeed, the grave will not hold them. Indeed, the grave will not hold you. There is certain hope. There is eternal life. They will live. You will live forever, those who trust in him. And so hope and purpose is restored. Their lives will not be uh, an exercise in futility. Their lives will not uh, be pointless. Indeed, God will use them. Christ has now commissioned them. They will proclaim his word that they might forgive sins or retain sins on his authority. And so the word of life will spread that more might be delivered from hopelessness, from their sins. Christ was crucified. Christ is risen. And because he lives, the disciples live as well. We live in a society, though, that largely lacks purpose and hope. In so many ways, by so many examples, we see a large pop part of the population operating aimlessly with no knowledge, no confidence of the eternal life that comes in Christ. If we look at the aimless ways, just a few, for example, the materialism of our day. Americans driving themselves deep into debt because they want the latest and the biggest and the newest whatever. Or perhaps they're just trying to fill a void. There's something that's missing. They can't put their finger on it. But if I only go and get on Amazon, that will fill it as long as it's here in 24 hours or less. But often it creates a bigger debt, a financial debt, but so overwhelmed, so perhaps not even aware of their need. There's nothing, though, compared to the debt of sin that man has apart from Christ. And life, life without him is truly empty. Or perhaps there's the escapism of our day. We could talk about binge-watching your favorite drama or uh, reality show. If only my life was like that life, living life below zero in, in minus 20-degree weather in an igloo up in the northern part of, part of Alaska, then my life would be better. Or perhaps in the tropics where it's warmer. If only. Because my life is too mundane a desire to escape where I am right now. Or perhaps we can identify with those who are really surviving or those who are racing or those who are becoming the latest and the greatest. But on the last day, though, all of this will crumble to dust and be nothing. Now, all of those things make perfect sense if there is no hope that Christ has risen from the dead. For if Christ is not risen, if he has not risen, then there is no hope. You ultimately have no purpose. Then why not? Now, we can forget society out there. What about you? What about me? What about, uh, even though there's a society out there that, that lacks so much purpose, what about us? The devil will use any and more of those things to reduce you to futility as well. <clears throat> he can use the idolization of money. He can use relationships that uh, are either good or bad. He can use health that's either good or bad. A career to lure us from our Savior. He can use the devastation of these things to do the same. When finances crash or relationships fail, when health problems become chronic, or the career dead ends, then becomes the temptation to futility. Everything's fine as long as it's going good, but once it makes a nosedive, then the voices and the heart change. Those events will argue that life is aimless, or that you have no hope, or that you have no purpose. You're no longer necessary. 
There's a, a hidden blessing in these trials, though. Often when we're in the midst of them, we may not see the blessing in them. But there is a hidden blessing in such trials. It teaches us that apart from Christ, life is ultimately futile. Or at least it appears so. That everything fails or falls apart or breaks down or it dies. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 6, Peter writes, For now, rather, now for a little while... If need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. He declares this important truth, that such trials and griefs demonstrate that these things do not last. Now for a little while, if need be, but they also point out what does last, what does endure. The faith which Christ gives you by the power of his spirit endures. It is a precious faith, faith in Christ. It's to his praise and honor and glory. And although all things may fall apart around you, Christ has died to redeem you. He's redeemed you from sin and death and hell. Christ is risen. He has conquered death. And he is a very present help in trouble. To the aimless disciples that Easter evening, he came into their midst. He came body and all and said, peace be with you. He gave them forgiveness, the forgiveness and life and salvation that he'd won for them on the cross. Christ's word, he then wants them to deliver that word and baptism and supper delivered to you on a regular basis so that you too may have forgiveness and life and hope. And the supper we have, uh, as we may have gathered yesterday uh, in a congregation, the supper we have, uh, the joy of being regularly reminded of what Christ brought the disciples that night as the pastor echoes the words, peace to you. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Christ, who died and rose again, now comes to you with his body and blood for the forgiveness of your sins. Christ is risen, therefore you have hope. And this gospel is good news. It's not a religious philosophy. It's a proclamation of fact that Christ is risen from the dead. So life is not futile. It's not a futile exercise as, as we wait, wait for Christ to return. This life is a journey through the wilderness as you wait the promised land. And in this desert, yes, there is suffering and grief, but as you suffer, you do so as one for whom Christ has suffered. And you endure with confident hope that he will raise you up on the last day where sin and death are no more. And so you do so with the glad or certain confidence that he forgives you all your sins of making idols out of the things of the world. And as times of grief might come, uh, grieve the death of others, you do so with the knowledge that your Savior has conquered death and the grave and risen again. He raises up all, all of his people to everlasting life. And even as we might contemplate our own living and dying, this certain hope is ours, that Christ is the first fruits from the dead. And as he has already shared his death and resurrection with you in holy baptism, you can be sure that on the last day, he will call you to eternal life. Christ is risen, therefore, you have hope. You also have purpose. You have purpose because you're the Lord's instruments for service in this world and whatever, whatever vocation he may put you in, the Lord will use you in those certain vocations to serve those around you. Those things that you do are not simply filling the time in a busy day, but they're ways and you are the means by which the Lord continues to care for the world and for others. And even should you become disabled or disadvantaged there that there is little you can do, you, can, you are still the Lord's instruments. And sometimes God uses us actively to serve others. Sometimes he uses us passively. So we can rejoice even as he uses us uh, to serve others. 
however God uses you. You are his. So Christ is risen. He's risen indeed. Alleluia. Thank you for joining us for Chapel. The broadcast of Chapel is underwritten by LCMS International Mission and Ministry to the Armed Forces. To learn more about long and short-term opportunities to serve internationally, visit servenow.lcms.org.